Hi, good morning, everyone. So, um, so from today, we'll talk about uh, Hopfield networks, which is a kind of a recurrent neural network, network in which there are feedback connections, so there are loops. Since we have just two weeks to go, I'll uh, uh, discuss Hopfield network in this week. And next week, I'll just uh, describe some research topics. I'll talk about some of the projects we are doing in my lab. And if anybody is interested, you can you know, uh, do internship or you know, small projects or something like that in my lab. So we'll talk about some of these topics in Hopwell Network. It's a binary model. We'll talk about the update equation. We'll talk about convergence and Hebbian learning, etc. So then we'll also talk about uh, the capacity results of Hopwell Network, how much memory it can store, the other problems of usage of Hopwell Network as a memory. Um, then we'll talk about continuous network. And uh, then finally, we'll apply this to a model of human memory. Because since it's a computational neuroscience course, we need to look at the relevance of this model to <clears throat> the real brain. So we'll talk about how a modification of Hopkins network uh, called the cohen grossberg network. And if we develop it even further, you can connect it to a, to a model of hippocampus, which is a model of, uh, which is a part in the brain uh, which is involved in short-term memory. That it's involved in something called uh, memory consolidation. So that is a sequence of ideas we'll uh, we'll follow in this next few classes. So, like I said, Hopkins network is a is an example of a recurrent neural network. That is a recurrent neural network as opposed to a feed-forward neural network. Because until now uh, we've been discussing perceptron, MLP, deep networks, and all that. All these are examples of what is called a feed-forward neural network, in which uh, the information flow is only in a single direction. So you you will never come back to the starting point, right? Because there are no loops. Whereas in the brain, it's very common that if a part of the brain, if a, let's say you take cortex, right? If a cortical area projects to another cortical area B, you know, A projects to B, then very often the cortical area B projects back to A. So this kind of a right uh, feed forward and feedback connections are very common. Such connections in the context of cortex are called reentrant connections. So if that is the case, then what is the point of using uh, uh, feed-forward networks all the time? So what we have seen in the last class is that even feed-forward networks can uh, uh, explain some of the activation patterns that we see in real brain. Right? We have made made those comparisons, but point is that worked out because. Uh, what we have compared right is only the time average activities of uh, the fMRI data so that they, they, they what they do is they average over time and just they focus on which parts of the brain are active but they don't talk about the temporal signature of that activation right so ignore that and only look at the areas which are active and the intensity of the activation so therefore we are able to explain some of the brain data using the feedforward network which is a static network there's no dynamics in a feed forward network because there's no loops. At the moment you have a loop, uh, you'll have dynamics. And there's no loop uh, when you give input x, instantaneously you'll get the output y. And there is no memory because there's no loops inside the network. Whereas in a recurrent network, the very first feature is that there are loops. So if I have some activation here x, so then that becomes y, and then y is fed back here, which means the activation y is fed back here from from previous time from the past so therefore uh, you will have loops you will have memory of, because you'll have to keep information from the past states so specifically we look at one particular recurrent network is a very broad class of architectures any network which has any loop inside right that can be called a recurrent neural network but uh, hopwell network is a special kind of neural network a very old one in which there are n neurons, and each neuron is connected to every other neuron. So if you have n neurons, you have a matrix of n square connections. Right? That is the Hopkins network. So a network like that can be used as a memory because, uh, like we have just argued, whenever you have loops in a network, you have memory. Because to even define a loop, you need to invoke an input from the past state. So therefore, you so the information can go over and over again in the loop and uh, get stuck there so it, you know so therefore you can have memory so whenever we talk about memory the first thing you think of is uh, the computer memory 
right? Because computer, if you have hard disk, you have RAM, you can store information. The kind of memory used in a computer is often called an index memory. What is memory? Best example is uh, a telephone directory. Right, I mean, you may, not have, you may not have seen a telephone directory because they're all gone with, with the internet. But uh, in my younger days, we used to use something called a telephone directory. Right? It's usually a fat book, you know, and uh, the telephone numbers are listed in alphabetical order with reference to the last names of people. So you'll have last name, that right? it's a last name one, last name two, last name three, and so on. Uh, next to every name, you have the address of the person and the telephone number. So that's how it, it goes, you know. Uh, row after row. So for this kind of a memory to work, you need to know the index of that record. So uh, each uh, telephone number is a part of a record. To access that record, you need to give the index of that record, which is where it's indexed uh, based on the last name. So you need to know the last name of the person. right? And then it will give you the first name of the person, the address, the physical address, and the telephone number. Whereas this, this kind of memory is good, this is how the computer memory works. But it's not very natural because that's not how we work. That's not how human memory memory works. Because uh, uh, because so normally if you want to recall a person, you might recall a person. So if you recall the person's name, you can recall the person's appearance, or right, let's say the face. Or if you see the face, you'll remember the name. If you see the name, you remember the face. Or if you remember some mannerisms of the face of the person, you remember both the face and the name. Or if you re recall the person's spouse or father or son, then again you can recall the person. So point is the item can be recalled based on many other cues. There is no single or a singular uh, thing by which you recall the individual, which is uh, like like an index. So similarly, even telephone directory, the better way to organize telephone directory is not like this, what you have seen in the telephone directory. Uh, everything is uh, uh, organized against the index. But a more natural organization will be, right? We have names, addresses, and telephone numbers. If you have any one of these three things, you should be able to pull out the other two. This is quite useful also in real, in real life because uh, said, let us say you write your uh, you know, telephone, you know you, you'll be talking to somebody and you know you, that person tells you this telephone number. You know it down on a piece of in a rough paper. And two days later you see the number but uh, you forgot whose whose number it is. So it's very often useful to be able to find out right uh, from the name of the person given the telephone number. Similarly, you know where a person lives, you visited that person but you don't know their phone number. So it would be ideal if uh, there is a mechanism by which Right, given one of them, you can get the other two. So the traditional telephone directors don't give that, but you know, with internet, everything is possible. So this kind of a thing where it's not just uh, uh, indexed after, you know, after one parameter, the index, right? But many things can, so each thing can act as an address to the other things, right? So this kind of memory is called an associative memory because there's simply an association of one thing with the other. Right, ideally in a bidirectional fashion. Index memory, it is index uh, index which links you to name, address, that is a physical address, etc. And these these arrows are unidirectional. You cannot go from address to index. So index here is the last name. Okay, whereas in associative memory, it's uh, bidirectional or multidirectional because there are multiple items and we where each thing can act as a cue to the all the other things. So this is a more natural kind of a memory and this is what we want. And what Hopi Network uses is exactly this kind of memory as we will see very soon. So uh, another example of uh, associative memory is if you give part of the information, it will give you the whole. Because in case of the telephone directory, if you give part of the information, which is just the name, it will give you the address and the telephone number. Or if you have another part of the information, which is the telephone number, it will give you the remaining parts, which is the name and the address. So in associative memory, you can look at it slightly differently. That is, it is an association between a part and the whole. Right Here, one way to look at it is, it is association of multiple items. If you give as input, as a, you probe it with one item, it will give you all the other related items. That is one way to look at it. Or think of all the items as part of a very large pattern. And in that pattern, I give 
part of the pattern and it retrieves the complete pattern and just fills it up, completes it. If you look at it that way, you can think of this example as another associative memory where I give part of the Mona Lisa picture, which is just the eyes, and the memory will pull up the complete picture. Or I give only the mouth part, it will pull up the complete picture. Or the for part of the forehead and it will fill up the complete picture. So the idea is, in, the, in, in this case, it is a part is given as input to the memory and memory retrieves the whole. Different parts can be given, but uh, at the end of it, it will retrieve the same complete whole picture. So you see that the memory, SOG memory operation will be quite different. So the network which will give this kind of functionality will also be quite different from a deep network. Uh, because, uh, or in, a, in the sense of a feed forward network. In a feed forward network, have the input and the output and there's nothing else, nothing else happens. It's a static function. Whereas in associative memory, there has to be, when you give an input, uh, you pull up the complete pattern. There has to be some kind of a memory. There is must be dynamics within the network because of all the loops. So how does it happen? So I give an input to the, the network, which is like the this partial pattern. I can think of a partial pattern as some kind of an initial condition of the network because network goes through a, bunch, a, a loop, a sequence of steps. So initial, you can think of the initial pattern as an, as an incomplete pattern where only part of the information is filled, the remaining part is all, let's say it's all zeros. I'll call this uh, image as x0, as the image at the zeroth iteration, zero time step. I give that as input to the Hopkill network, and it will network will crunch through it, it will operate, um, process it multiple times, right? So x0 becomes x1, and you know, and so on and so forth. And x1 becomes x2, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you are left with x of capital T after capital T time steps. So hopefully it converges, right? The sequence of vectors converges to some final final state. And that final state is, let us say, your complete monolisa picture. So you can think of the network performing an operation like this, where it starts from an initial state. The initial state corresponds to an incomplete image, where only part of the image is given, the rest of the image is all just zeros, blanks. And I take that uh, image or a vector, I can always it as a vector. It, the network takes that vector as a starting point and just operates on it, right? And uh, the vector is updated, right? X0, X1, X2, and so on. It evolves through time. And after some capital T time steps, it con the sequence converges. The final converge, the vector to which it converges corresponds to the complete image, the complete pattern, picture of the Mona Lisa. Now, these kinds of uh, memories, right, uh, resemble another kind of memory. Right, which is uh, which is our study in physics and engineering. These are called holograms. So the story of the connection between memory and hologram is, is very interesting. This, this psychologist called Carl Prybram, yeah, right, uh, was interested in studying human memory. And he was one of uh, the stu students of this guy called uh, Lashley. I think we talked about Lashley briefly in the very first or second lectures, I remember right. So we talked about history of neuroscience very quickly. Lastly, I was interested in the problem of engrams. Engram means what is the substrate in the brain which holds on to memory? How are memories stored in the brain physically, in the tissue of the brain? So that that representation of the brain of the memory in the brain, he called it the engram. So to study what exactly is this engram and how exactly memories are stored in the brain, Lastly performed some interesting experiments with the rats again. So, you know, rats are very good at uh, learning mazes. Uh, so if you leave it in a complicated maze, it will run around for some time and find the escape route. After that, if you leave it back in the same maze, it will quickly it'll, it'll remember the maze, the layout of the maze, remember the escape route, and quickly escape from the maze. So that's a very good example of memory, right? So he has taken these rats, trained them on you know, how to escape mazes, and then he, to, he started damaging different parts of the brain to see damage to which part of the brain affects the escape performance of the rat. So to that end, he made an interesting curve. Uh, so that is, uh, so the x-axis is the extent of 
damage. So actually, what he has done, he has made sharp cuts. So this is the rat's brain. Okay, so two hemispheres. He made sharp cuts like this, sliced the brain. And then the extent of damage is the total length of all these cuts. That's the x-axis. And uh, the y-axis is escape time. How long do they take to escape? And he found that it simply goes up like that. Uh, it doesn't depend upon where exactly the cuts are made. It only depends on the extent of the cut. Okay, so he kind of concluded that memory is all over the place in the brain and it's not localized to one part of the brain. Because localization of information in the brain is very important. Uh, very, It's felt to be very important for a long time because people found that you know, there is visual area in the occipital lobe, there is somatosensory area, the touch information stored in the you know, post, you know, uh, in the you know, post central gyrus in the parietal area and so on and so forth. So people love to localize functions as if you know, it explains really how, how that you know, brain performs that function. So anyway, so there is no such localization was found because first of all, these experiments are a bit crude, right? And this is the kind of conclusion he came to. So Carl Pribram was not satisfied with that because it still says it is distributed, but it doesn't tell you exactly mathematically how is it distributed, how is memory distributed in the brain? How can you have a memory distributed in a network, right? So he was thinking about this question and Pribram's son happens to be a physicist. So, and uh, one day his uh, son was talking about uh, this latest, this was in the 70s or really long ago. His son was very excited about uh, this. He was talking about this uh, new development in physics called holograms, right, which you can construct using lasers. And uh, so holograms were also popularized very well in some of the early movies. This is the first Star Wars, which came in the late 70s. You know, you might have remembered, you know, still remember these visuals from first Star Wars where you see Princess Leia, picture of Princess Leia projected by R2-D2 as a hologram, right? So this caught the public imagination and uh, Prabhupada's son was also talking about holograms, right? And uh, this picture is memory of some information and uh, this is uh, constructed, this hologram was based on the principle of interference of light. So we know that light is a wave, you know, it's an electromagnetic wave. And uh, you know, like any wave, it, it shows the properties of interference, right? You can, if two waves are in sync, you know, they, they add up and the, the amplitude becomes larger. We call it the constructive interference. If two waves are out of sync or, in, or out of phase, they cancel out each other and that is called destructive interference. So if you take a monochromatic wave, which is and a coherent wave, like a laser, pass it through a single slit and which again is split into, a, into two slits. Right now, the, the two slits produce two different uh, wave patterns. These two wave patterns interfere and uh, if you have a screen beyond them, right, it will produce a interference pattern, which will produce a nice black and white band pattern. This is called the interference pattern. So now imagine how you can produce an interference pattern related to an object and store the information about that object. So here I have, I have an object which I'm, for which I'm trying to construct a hologram. I have a coherent light beam, like a laser, right? It falls on this first mirror, uh, which is a beam, beam splitter. That is part of the light goes straight forward and part of that gets reflected and goes down, right? And here, so this is a beam splitter that is it allows light to go in both directions. It allows light to go beyond and also partly reflects it downwards. So the one that goes, beam that goes straight, falls on the object, gets reflected. And uh, so because of the surface features of the object, the beam gets reflected in various ways. So it's initially, the, it's a planar wave. All the phases are equal, right, along every plane. But once it bounces off the object surface and all the phases change, the phase pattern becomes very complicated. And that that is what is contained in the object beam, the so-called object beam. Now the other beam is just uh, same coherent light beam, bounce of the beam splitter, bounce of the mirror, and again comes here. This is called the reference beam. So the reference beam and object beam interact with each other, interfere with each other, produce an interference pattern which is unique to that object's shape. So just like the black and white uh, pattern that you find here, 
in this double slit experiment. You, you produce a complicated uh, interference pattern which is unique to that object and it is, this is captured on a photographic plate. Now, if you want to recreate that object, a uh, kind of visual of that object, right, you take the same photographic plate, uh, pass it, uh, you know, pass a kind of a, <coughs> another beam, uh, another coherent beam, which is laser, uh, which is called, the, this is called the reconstruction beam. It goes through this uh, photographic plate, and on the other side, right, it gets uh, passes through it and goes can be seen from the other side. And uh, th there you see the phase pattern, right? So because of the black and white interference pattern on the photographic plate, it it distorts the, the incoming beam and uh, produces a phase pattern in the beam which is like the original phase pattern that we got in, from the object, in the object beam. So you will see the object uh, beam. So what is different about this visual compared to a normal, uh, you know, the visual that you get from a photograph of an object is that in a photograph, you only capture the light intensity pattern. In a hologram, it also captures the phase pattern, pattern so that the object looks like a, looks more realistic, more real. It looks like a 3D version of the object rather than flat, like in case of a photograph. So another very interesting property of a photograph compared to a uh, hologram is this. That is, uh, let's say I have, a, I have a negative of a person, a uh, photo, and I develop it and I get the positive, uh, which looks like this. Now in the negative, I make a small damage. I mess up, I cut out this part or scratch out this part. Then when, when I develop this negative in the developed photo, I only have that part missing, nothing else is missing. So the other remaining part of the photograph is undisturbed. Whereas a hologram is different. Let's say I take a hologram, right? And I damage, uh, the, that is that interference pattern, the photographic plate. You damage a small part of it and then reconstruct the hologram. You don't just see a small, you know, black dot or a patch on the on the on the photogram, uh, on the hologram. The whole image looks slightly fuzzier. So it is a small distra local distraction gets distributed, and you get the uh, you get the complete picture, able to get the complete picture, but with a small damage. So this is an example of how information is stored and you know, memorized in a distributed fashion in this photographic plate, where in the normal photograph, light, light photograph, information is not distributed, right? Uh, every uh, part of the negative holds information, but only a small part of the original picture. Whereas in a hologram, it is somehow information is distributed in a holistic fashion. Every part of the hologram contains information about the whole, which almost sounds, you know, very mysterious, somewhat philosophical. So, so that is how hologram works. And what is interesting is that is how the Hopwell network works. It is a source information in distributed fashion. So that if you damage a part of the Hopwell network, it will still retrieve the pattern, but uh, there is an overall degradation in the pattern. You don't see like one link, one limb or leg uh, missing. So to summarize, the Hopwell network is a very interesting, I haven't even defined what it is, but I'll just say that it brings together a lot of ideas to put together a model of an associative memory. Okay, it's a model of human memory, which is an associative memory. Oh, sorry. And it happens to use our good old Makalo and Pitts neuron model, just like the MLP, which is good. Then it has connection to holograms, analogy to holograms. Okay, and uh, we'll also see that it has analogy to what is called magnetic materials. Because Hopfield is actually a physicist. He has borrowed ideas from the physics of magnetic materials. Then to make this work, you use a learning mechanism. Because in any neural network, you need to have a learning mechanism. Use the learning mechanism called Hebbian learning. Which came from neurobiology. 
that is when you store information in the, in the you know, neural network, you store it in the connections. But what is the mechanism? How exactly do the what exactly do the connections store? Right? And how does it happen? How does the cellular activity get stored in the connections? So this guy called Donald have proposed the learning mechanism way back in the late 40s. And that was uh, essentially proved to be true in neurobiological experiments performed in the 60s. So have, uh, Hopfield has exactly used the same learning mechanism, Hebbian learning mechanism. So you see that it puts together, uh, it brings together ideas from so many different fields, right? So this is from, you know, physics and engineering, this is physics and engineering, this is from, again, neuroscience, this is from psychology, this is from neuroscience. So it brought together ideas from such diverse fields, right, and put together this very interesting model. So, the, so this software network is a model of an associative memory, right, it's a, it's a network of n neurons where uh, every neuron is connected to every other neuron, like this. And each neuron is uh, the has a binary state because typically the neuron models that we have seen they all have binary states. And uh, so we I think I described once before that uh, when you have binary state it can be one zero kind of state or one minus one kind of state. So in this case it is one minus one kind of binary state. So when you have n neurons uh, the states of each the neurons are defined as Capital B, the bold type, is a vector of the states. It's given by B1, B2, etc. after Bn. And typically, the network is fully connected. So we'll also see what happens. Uh, uh, yeah, if I have time, I'll talk about those results. Basically, if you damage some connections, your performance will even improve. So that's uh, some really interesting results like that. So network is fully connected, and uh, that is defined. The connections are defined by weight matrix. So when you have when n neurons where every neuron is connected to every other neuron, you can describe the, all the connections using a matrix of you know size n by n. That means that that is a weight matrix. So so what happens here is uh, since every neuron is connected to every other neuron, right? Uh, these connections are defined by the weights w i j. So v i is the state of the ith neuron, v j is the state of the jth neuron. And the weight going from the jth neuron to the ith neuron is WIJ. So now how will this network work? Right? Um, I can define it like this. So because VI, this is a McCallum and Pitts neuron. So VI, the output of the ith neuron, is given by, uh, since it's implementing the McCallum and Pitts neuron, it must be equal to, so I'll use the notation. So I'm more comfortable with G, used to G. Okay, so here I'm using sigma. That's for sigmoid function. The sigmoid function, right, of the sum of Wij times Vj. Because you, the ith neuron gets input from any other neurons. Right, and you sum them all by weight, take a weighted sum by the weights and pass it through the sigmoid function. Actually, the sigmoid function that we're looking at here is a step function. Because here the binary neuron has a state of uh, let's say z minus one one kind of plus or minus one kind of binary state. This happens to be the signum function, which is given by sigma. So this is the update equation. That is VI is given by this. But point, but the problem with this description is VI is given by this entire expansion. This expansion goes where from j equal to one to capital N, where N is the number of neurons. If that is the case, then there will be one J where J is equal to I, right? That means VI will be on the left side and VI will also be on the right side. What does it mean? Right? To clarify that, what we will say is the VI that you find on the right side is from previous time, right? The VI that you have on the left side is next time, next time step. Okay, so so to clarify this, uh, you know, to give a meaning to this existence of a loop, right? Because same uh, output is again presented to itself. Because this is a, this is a self loop. Uh, so to clarify that. What we'll say is all the state variables on the right side, right, are taken at time t. The state variable which are calculating next and updating, that corresponds to the time t plus one. So we t plus one is equal to sigma of 
so the sigma function of sigma summed over j equal to 1 to capital n w i j b j which is a, which is a time t so because of because uh, this step takes you from b at the 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 bol type which is a vector of states takes to v at t plus 1 right so this is update it has a uh, sorry it has dynamics so no no we need to worry about where does the dynamics take you so if you keep on changing vt like that what will happen to it ultimately this is what we need to answer so we have vi at t plus 1 which is equal to the sigma uh, and then summation of w j v j t right so you will have a start this update rule from some v of 0 some initial vector then v of 0 will give you v1 and then v2 and so on and so forth it will keep on evolving what will happen to the sequence of vectors this is what you need to answer so imagine the situation right first we'll imagine it then we'll make it real we'll actually realize it that is so let's have a sequence of vectors v not v1 v2 and so on imagine that after some time these vectors will converge right and uh, you will have after some time t capital t that vt plus 1 is equal to vt so it just will stops at some some kind of equilibrium state and that is one thing next thing you also imagine further that depending upon the initial condition right uh, it may go to different final states so i said in here that the sequence we have assumed that it will converge onto some final state but uh, you won't go to the same final state for every initial condition some initial conditions take you to uh, some state and some other initial condition take you to some other state which is kind of depicted in this slightly messy picture so imagine i start from here because i am moving in jumps because v not this vector v is not changing continuously in the state space it is making jumps because every update uh, is update of a binary variable from 1 to minus 1 or minus 1 to 1 so you go like this right uh, you go in jumps and after a few jumps it is stabilized once you go to some point it will stay there forever so again another set of right so like that you let's say you make some jumps and so all these initial conditions take you to this final state similarly all these initial condition take you to this other final state and so on so every initial condition doesn't necessarily take you to the same final state some so uh, some take you to some and some takes you something else so so here also let us imagine that so you have lots of initial so you have uh, n dimension space so you have totally Uh, since you have n-dimensional binary vectors, you have totally two power n states. So among those two power n states, all these part states in the state space take you to this particular final state. I'll call this state one. <coughs> And all these initial states in the state space take you to this final state. I'll call this state two. And so on and so forth. Let us imagine that we have a scenario like this. then see something beautiful coming out of this right this the dynamics because it is that we were using here right this kind of update rule which gives you dynamics is able to divide the entire state space into some partitions because the partitions are defined by uh, this that is all the initial conditions which will take you to a given final state that is one partition so like that uh, the dynamics is able to divide the entire state space into certain partitions and you can think of each partition as a memory why is that because what does a memory do it takes an incomplete pattern as in this case of the monolith structure it takes an incomplete pattern and gives you the corresponding complete pattern in more general mathematical terms it takes a initial condition x not processes it a few times And then gives you a final set x. The initial condition x not put or correspond to only the picture of the nose, picture of the eyes, picture of the mouth, picture of forehead, whatever it is. It will retrieve finally the entire picture, which is some kind of a unique 
final state. So mathematically, that's what we are trying to achieve here. Right. So this state could imagine Mona Lisa's eyes. This state could imagine Mona Lisa's nose, and so on. All of them correspond to the same final state, which is a complete Mona Lisa picture. Right. So, so each of them, right, these initial states represent some kind of a distorted version of Mona Lisa's picture, and the final state that you go to represents the complete perfect picture of Mona Lisa. Like that, imagine this is Mona Lisa, this is, I don't know, Christopher Columbus, this is Amitabh Bachchan, whatever, right? Uh, so, so this is how the network is trying to store, image, store patterns. It can be images, it can be anything, it's just vectors. By partitioning the input space into certain partitions. Now, further on, now think of uh, achieving this using some kind of an energy function. So think, imagine that. There is some kind of energy function or a cost function. And as the network steps through these states, V0, V1, V2, V3, and so on, imagine it is doing some kind of a gradient descent on some energy function. Okay, so so what I'm saying is this kind of dynamics you can get if you have some kind of energy function. But we are used to the idea of energy function, we use the idea of a cost function, right, in the context of MLP, because in MLP also we have seen that uh, there is this output error function, which will have many minima. And then, right, the final state that we go to corresponds to local minimum, right? We always try to, whatever the weight learning corresponds to going down this output error cost function. So similarly here also, this dynamics over V, imagine that it corresponds to doing gradient descent over some kind of a cost function. We'll call it an energy function. You can call it anything that you like, objective function, whatever you want. So then what happens is if I start from anywhere in this neighborhood, in the neighborhood of this minimum, I land here. If I start from anywhere in the neighborhood of this minimum, I land here. So you see that presence of this minima in the energy function divides the entire state space into certain uh, what are called basins of attraction, right? Or in other words, partitions. So because, because of the presence of minimum here, it will partition this region into one partition. So wherever, no matter where you start in this region, you'll, you'll land here. Similarly, no matter where you start in this region, right, you'll land here. Okay, so like that, presence of these attractors partitions the input space, right? So this is a set of ideas we'll use in the construction of the Hopkins network. So basically, this is an update tool for the optical network, right? There's a weight matrix, there is a state variable or state vector. And uh, this update rule will basically update the state and the state keeps on evolving. Next, we will say that there exists a certain cost function or the energy function associated with this update rule. And we will also prove that this energy function keeps on going down always. Every time you update this function, the corresponding energy function of V keeps going down. So we also say that the energy function is bounded. So therefore, when, as you keep updating uh, V, energy function keeps on going and hit a, hit a minimum at some point. This minimum is corresponds to this minima of this energy function. So therefore, it will settle down there. So basically, this combination of an update rule and a corresponding energy function, and the fact that the update rule basically performs gradient descent over the energy function, gives you all the ingredients to construct a memory model. This is basically what the Hopkins network, network model has done. OK, so how do you show that? So look at this expression. The energy function expression is e equal to minus half. The half is used because it's, it's nice you know, to differentiate. This is a quadratic expression. If you differentiate this, you get a 2 as a factor, and the 2 will cancel out with this half. Okay, so minus half times sigma sigma, you have a double loop, right, uh, going over you know, i and j. Each uh, summation goes uh, from 1 to n. You have wij times vin vj. So you have products of pairs of terms, right, vi and vj. And uh, multiplied by the corresponding connection, connection which is wij. 
right? So you'll have n square terms in this because you have a double loop going from i to n. Now what we need to show is, uh, so with that we can stop. What we need to show is whenever you update uh, any bit, any one state, vi, right? And assuming that the state actually changes, because sometimes what can happen is, you apply the update rule, right, for a given uh, neuron, i. So before the update, neuron could be minus one. After update, also it could be minus one, that it can happen. There's no guarantee that every time you apply the update rule, this, the bit actually changes, right? So therefore, uh, it can change or it did not change also. So if it doesn't change, then nothing to show, because we already wanted to show that every time it changes, E will uh, keep on decreasing only, right? Or it doesn't change. It will never increase. That's what we need to show. So if the bit doesn't change, there's nothing to show. So let's take only the case when the bit actually changes. The change can occur from minus 1 to 1 or 1 to minus 1. Okay? So in that case, we'll show that the energy function only decreases always. Here we need one more uh, requirement. That is the weights must be symmetric. That is, the weight going from i to j must be equal to the weight going from j to i. So the W matrix must be a symmetric matrix. And that's a requirement. Then the self-loop term, that is the connections of a neuron, connection of a neuron to itself, like WII term, they all should be positive. So these two are the requirements. WII term should be positive. WIJ must be equal to WJL. So these two are requirements for this weight matrix. That's all that is required. And uh, you can show that uh, the energy function uh, keeps going down. How do we do that? So let us assume that the ith bit is changed. So I have a change update in the ith bit. So I take that, I assume that the update is delta VI, which I assume is non-zero, right? And then you will easily show that if I update the ith uh, variable here, the delta VI it is taken out, and you get a summation like this. J is not equal to I, some uh, going up to capital N, WIJ, VJ. So then delta VI we can easily show is equal to, the minus delta VI we can easily show is equal to 2 VI. So why is that? Let us look at this. Let us look at the only two cases, two ways in which VI can get updated. Initially, VI is 1. After the update, it is become, it's become minus 1. Initially, VI is minus 1. After update, it became 1. So therefore, uh, delta VI is defined as VIT plus 1 minus VIT. So therefore, in the first case, it is minus 2. Second case, it is plus 2. So, so you can see that this is equal to minus 2 times VI in both cases. It is equal to minus 2 times VI at T. So therefore, this Del minus delta VA can be written as 2 VIT. Okay, so that's what we substituted here. So we have this summation which goes from J not equal to I, right, uh, going up to N. So to, in order to make it complete summation, J going from 1 to N, we need to add and subtract this term. We add and subtract this term at 2 WIA VI square plus, uh, right, minus 2 WIA VI square. Why is that? Because it's one of the terms in this summation this full summation. So if you add and sub subtract that, and if you absorb, so VI square is always one, because VI is plus or minus one, so VI square is always one. So if you absorb the first sum into summation, you can get it all this inequality, and you have just J, equal to J going from one to n. You get this, minus two WI. So if you look at this expression, two VI at T times the summation, you see that uh, the next, step of vi, the next state of vi here, depends on this summation. Sigma basically right, takes the sign of this argument. Okay, So the sign is depends on the argument. So this is that argument, right? So if the, right, if, so we said that first of all, vi changes its sign. The vi is actually getting updated. So the sign of this must be, must be the, opposite of the sign of VI, because VI is updated from T to T plus 1. Therefore, uh, the sign of this must be opposite of VI. So therefore, the product of these two must be always positive. Right? Uh, sorry, always negative, because two signs are opposite. So this part is negative. And we also said WIA is 
positive. Therefore, this part is also negative. So what that shows is delta E is always negative. So if delta E changes at all, it will only be negative. So therefore, uh, the energy function keeps going down. And we also know the energy function is bounded because W's are all bounded, V's are all bounded, V's are all binary. So E is bounded and delta is, is goes down whenever it is updated. So therefore, it will keep on going down. And the only time it stops is when VI also doesn't change. That shows that it's an energy function. So now next we need to see exactly how do you derive the learning rule? That is, uh, how do you store information? We said that if W is symmetric, right, you have minima. But uh, how do you make sure that the minima is at the at a vector that is that you want to store, right? So that we will see in the next.